Friends, welcome to our worship today on 13th of September. There are some of us meeting this morning at Brombra. Others of you are reading um, the worship this morning. Some of you are watching this video and others listening to the podcast. Wherever you are, however you're joining in, welcome to our worship. Our call to worship this morning. Draw close, for Jesus is among us. Draw closer, for he calls us to unite. Be still and let us worship him together. We listen to our first hymn. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. give you thanks for your everlasting love. You remain our constant companion. You share in our hope and our dreams. Console us when we are in trouble and are ever ready to help us when our strength fails. 
we remain in your constant debt, an obligation that can never be settled, to love you and our neighbour and care for your creation, even when we forget you, lost in feelings of self-sufficiency, your spirit calls us and restores us to your side. We give thanks for your forgiveness. When we have gone astray, may it inspire us to a new way of living, when we might join with you in singing a new song. Lord Jesus, for words and actions we regret, for the hurt we have caused, restore what we have broken. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, for rejection of our neighbour, for communities in conflict, forgive us for ignoring the wonder of your healing presence. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, for those who suffer hunger, for the homeless and oppressed, help us to reach out in loving service. Lord, have mercy. In the abundance of God's grace, May we know your mercy and forgiveness, and in living this grace, may we forgive others. In Jesus' name, Amen. We hear a reading from Paul's letter to those in Rome, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. The weak and the strong. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarrelling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. That was Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. We listen to this beautiful song, The Lord is Our Salvation. Oh 
Adrian, thank you so much for singing and leading us in our worship. The Lord is our salvation. We hear now our gospel reading. This is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. 
Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Forgive them. You've got to be joking. I can't possibly do that. Do you have any idea what they've done to me? God will never forgive me. How could he do that? Or perhaps we've said, how could I have done such an awful thing? Maybe when we were younger, we've said, it, it wasn't me, it was, and then we pointed probably to a sibling. We've all said these words, we've all had these words spoken to us, we've all lived these words, and these words are part of our history of life and faith. I know that in recent times we probably haven't been on a car trip, or a bus trip, or a train trip, or a plane trip, and depending where you're going, they're often fun. We're going somewhere nice, we're going to experience something, but those trips we haven't had for a while. But there is another kind of trip, it's called the guilt trip. Have we had those? They're not such good fun, are they? They're part of our story too, those guilt trips, those things in our lives when we've said something or done something and it's part of who we have become. We all feel a sense of guilt. Not the kind of legal, innocent and guilty type of guilt, but, but guilt about our lives. And at the outset, God does not want us to feel guilty because that sense of feeling guilty brings about a fear. There's a fear of life, a fear of, of being found out, a, a fear of being disowned by others. What if they really knew what I was like? A, a, film, a fear of retaliation of someone um, 
coming after us and we're looking over our shoulder. The fear of being judged. And through that judging of being ostracised. It's not a good trip to be on. A guilt trip. It's hard and it's painful. In 2006, in Nickel Mines, an Amish community, Charles Carl Roberts shot 10 female students at a school. Five of them fatally, and then he shot himself. And the front of the newspaper, a few days later, brandished one word. I wonder what one word you would use. Anger? Hatred? This one word was a word that was chosen by other people in their lives. Gordon Wilson, remember him? When his daughter was killed in Enniskillen? The one word used by this Amish community was the word forgiveness. We're going to see a short snippet of a video that came after those shootings in Nickel Mines. And for those listening on the podcast, you can find this video by searching um, in Google or any other search engine for Nickel Mines Mother and Forgiveness. Let's watch this video. As the nation marks the anniversary this week of the Newtown, Connecticut school shooting, families of some of the 26 who were killed attended a vigil today at the National Cathedral in Washington. Prayers were offered for all of the victims of gun violence in this country, and that would include the five young Amish girls who were killed and five who were wounded just a few years ago in South Central Pennsylvania. Jeff Glor tells us that out of the horror of that school shooting has come a lesson in forgiveness. It's been seven years since Terry Roberts' life changed forever. In October 2006, her 32-year-old son Charlie walked into an Amish school in Lancaster County and shot 10 young girls before killing himself. I heard the sirens and saw helicopters. Then the phone was ringing and it was my husband. And he said, I need you to come to Charlie's house right away. And I got out of the car and I looked at my husband and these sunken eyes just saying, it was Charlie. That could not be. And yet it truly was, it was true, it was our son. Robert's initial reaction was that she had to move away. But the Amish came to her house the night of the shooting to say they wanted her to stay. Some of the victim's families attended her son's funeral. There are not words to describe how that made us feel that day. And then for the mother and father that had lost not just one, but two daughters at the hand of our son to come up and be the first ones to greet us. Wow, is there anything in this life we shouldn't forgive? Terry Roberts now shares this message with those who've experienced trauma. And every Thursday, she cares for the most seriously wounded survivor of the shooting, now 13. It's against Amish beliefs to appear on camera, so Donald Craighill often speaks on their behalf. You have this mother who raised a son that did this horrific damage to this young woman. And the mother has the courage and the spiritual fortitude to come back and to care for this uh, young woman. And the parents of the young woman welcome her into their home. It's a powerful, powerful story. Those families in Newtown who may still have understandably conflicted feelings now still less than a year later. What do you, what do you say to them? Ask God to provide new things in your lives new things to focus on and that doesn't take the place of what is lost but it can give us a hope and a future a future made possible for terry roberts because of forgiveness jeff glor cbs news lancaster county pennsylvania the word forgiveness caught the attention of the media of course it did it was countercultural. Not words of anger or frustration, but that of forgiveness. But what does it mean? What did it mean for the people in the Amish community to go to the mother of the killer and say they'd forgive her and her family in this unbelievable traumatic incident? Did they mean they forgave the murderer? Does it make sense? 
How does righteous indignation figure into the crimes of humanity? How can we have justice and forgiveness at the same time? How can we have accountability for violation of laws of God along with application of the mercy of God? Every one of us needs to understand and comes to terms with the issue of forgiveness. Because forgiveness, forgiveness is part of God's plan. When properly understood, it will not contradict God's justice. So before we go any further in looking at this Gospel of Matthew, we need to define forgiveness. So let's start with what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not compromise of morality. Forgiveness is not a violation of justice. Forgiveness is not the avoidance of conflict. I think if we're honest, most of us don't like conflict. We don't want to share hard feelings or harsh words with someone else. So we skirt around issues of conflict. Sometimes forbearance is the right thing to do. But a simple avoidance of conflict is not the same as forgiveness. So what is the real meaning of forgiveness? Well, for a moment, try to forget everything you've heard or assumed about forgiveness. What if forgiveness could mean release? So just for a moment, let's make, not make it any more complicated than that. Release. Forgiveness means to choose to take someone who you've been holding in debt to you, holding in resentment and bitterness, and to release them and release ourselves. Forgiveness is not calling something that someone else did that was immoral or destructive okay. It's not turning a blind eye towards injustice. Forgiveness simply means you choose to release somebody from a personal obligation to you. That sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? And Jesus knows it's difficult. Father, Forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. So we turn to our reading from Matthew's Gospel. This is Matthew chapter 18. And up steps Peter. I like Peter. I like him a lot because he says things that maybe I would say in the wrong way, in the wrong time. And he gets all confused and sometimes he has harsh words spoken to him too. But he steps up and he speaks in a way that perhaps... I can identify with. Sometimes he gets it right and sometimes he gets it wrong. And of course Peter knows what a guilt trip looks like. Remember the denial? Him fleeing the scene of the courtyard? He knows about guilt trips. He really does. So he says to Jesus, I'm going to quote, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? So Jesus, as we've heard in our reading, answers with a parable in which a man owns money. He tells us 10,000 gold bags. Wow, I mean, what has, he, what has he been spending it on? He must be somebody of quite influence to have that amount of money. And he pleads with forgiveness and he is granted forgiveness. The debt is wiped clear. Obligation has completely gone. He's freed. He's released from that debt. And so then he leaves the presence of the master and goes out. He then treats another with such disdain, such lack of forgiveness. He bounds the other, not just in owing him, but bounds him in prison. We need to look at the full context of this chapter. Jesus was speaking not only about forgiving one another, but about Christian character, both in and outside of relationships in the church. Last week we talked about what it is to be under discipline within the church, about um, speaking to another one-to-one -one when they've offended, or taking one other person with you, or, or bringing them before the church if they don't hear, or if necessary, letting them go. And Peter here is wanting to learn about forgiveness and benevolent and asks Jesus is seven times enough well I think where's that number come from we know seven is a good number biblically but where's it come from 
Well, the Jewish rabbis taught that forgiving someone more than three times was actually unnecessary. And they cited Amos chapter 1, verses 3 to 13, where God forgave Israel's enemies three times and then he punished them. So Peter saying by offering to forgive more than double what the Old Testament example was, Peter was perhaps thinking he might get an extra reward or commendation from Jesus. But when Jesus says that forgiveness is way more than that, Peter is a bit confused. And in fact, he's pretty stunned along with the rest of the disciples. Sometimes we're stunned too at other people's generosity to be gracious with us. Are we as gracious with others as that grace has been lavished upon us? These disciples, although they've been with Jesus for some time, were still thinking in terms of the law and not in terms of grace. Grace that we see in Jesus' life. By saying that you were to forgive others 77 times, Jesus is saying there's unlimited amounts in how you can forgive people. There's unlimited times for how we can forgive people, even those who continually offend us. As Christians, with forgiving hearts, with hearts full of grace, we should not limit the number of times we forgive. We forgive, we forgive, we forgive as much grace the thousandth time as we do the first time. And we are only capable as people of faith in forgiving if we have that grace of forgiveness in us, the Spirit of God living in us. For he is the one who provides the ability to offer forgiveness over and over, just as God forgives us over and over again. Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant follows directly after this 77 times speech driving home the importance, if we are forgiven, then we are to forgive others. Paul, in his teaching in Ephesians, talks about us forgiving one another. He does so in Colossians. But he says in Ephesians 4 verse 32, he admonishes us to forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Clearly, Forgiveness is to be abundant, overflowing and available to all, just as the grace of God is poured out upon us and is available for all. Martin Luther King said, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. So how can we apply that permanent attitude in our lives? Forgiveness is release being released by God, are we able to experience that release for ourselves and offer that same release, that same grace to others? Let us, friends, as we journey in this world around us in uncertain times, look towards the past, forgive, and move on in hope and faith, and hope and faith in the name of Jesus. Let us be released, that we may release others. In his name. Amen. Sovereign and forgiving God, strengthen us in our witness in our journey towards you. As we reflect on forgiveness and release, we think of people who have hurt us and the people that we have hurt. May we know the strength this very day of release of freedom and the power of forgiveness. You've made us into a family of faith. May we draw close to others on this pilgrimage journey, that we may journey to what is a life of hope and peace with you. Guide us and sustain us. Healing Spirit, breathe into our lives, our homes and our communities. Bring healing into fractured lives and relationships. May we, each of us, be reconcilers and bridge builders of truth. Companion Lord, as we take up our cross and follow you, 
May we bring light and peace into the world around us. May we bring strength to those who are unwell, consolation to the bereaved, peace to those who are anxious, confused and fearful. We look for a new hope, an assurance of a new dawn, as we focus on you and the cross. May we never lose hope, but take up our cross and follow you. Sustain us, lead us and equip us for our journey of life and faith. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, we listen to the song, Never Too Late. It's never too late to let go and start again. Sure. 
friends, a final blessing. Creator, forgiver and comforting God, may we know the strength of your spirit in our lives as we journey with you into the known and unknown encounters of the weeks to come. May we speak of your justice, live for you and know your grace and forgiveness in our lives that we may share that same forgiveness with others. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with you forevermore. Amen. May God bless you until we reunite again next Sunday for our worship. God bless.